our developer experience and evangelism team. My background is a developer for a long time. Uh, I live in Austin, Texas, and I'm very happy to be back at Oktoberfest. Been amazed with all the talks, and as usual, <coughs> taking away so many thoughts that will continue to stay with me throughout the year. So, very excited about that. Can you hear me okay from over here, or do I really have to stand here? Because I'm kind of a walking around type person. You can pull the mic too. Okay. All right, cool. So what I want to talk about today is Marie Curie uh, and some resonances that I found in her story, her work with modern uh, tech industry around open source, Kickstarter, and sort of women in tech, diversity and inclusion topics. So it all started with, with not progressing. It all started with a book that my dad gave me. So this was a present that my dad gave me. Uh, it's a book called Making Marie, Marie, Intellectual Property and Celebrity Culture in an Age of Information. So I don't know if we normally think about the early 1900s as an age of information, but that's the um, topic and stance that this book takes. It's a really great book. I recommend that you read it. Um, I'm going to give you some of the things that really stood out to me from this book, and hopefully that will maybe inspire you to go take a look at it. So what did I expect? I thought, okay, this will be a nice read. It's about my sort of hero from the third grade, Marie Curie, and I also like intellectual property law, so it'll, it'll be interesting. I did not expect to find all these parallels between what was going on today and what was going on during her life and work. And it's really stuck with me all through, it's been probably a year since I read the book, but I've gone back and reread it again because it's an interesting way to frame some of the events that are going on today. Okay, so quick refresher on Marie Curie. Uh, people have different levels of familiarity. So this is a quote that she gave, and I would say for most of my elementary to high school life, this is kind of matched with my impression. She was really gifted, she was really talented, she worked really hard, she made some discoveries and succeeded in science and was like a yay, go woman in science, and was sort of an icon for me. Uh, it turns out there's a lot more to the story. She did do all those things. She was gifted, she worked hard, she won Nobel Prizes, but there was a lot more interesting uh, color and facets around her story than just that. So what did she do? She was the first real researcher for radioactivity. So she actually coined the term radioactive. She discovered two elements. Um, she was part of a husband and wife team with her husband, Pierre. She was the first female professor at the Sorbonne. She was the first female to win a Nobel Prize, and she's still the only woman to have won the Nobel Prize in two different disciplines. So pretty impressive stuff, um, and it's, it's interesting to think about um, kind of what this meant to me as, as, as a person growing up. It was, here was the periodic table of the elements around 1898, and you can see there were all these elements that they thought should exist, but they hadn't found them yet. They couldn't prove their existence, right? So after Marie Curie had done her work, we you know, eventually get to the periodic table we have today, and polonium and radium are the two elements she found and fit in there. And this was interesting to me as um, a kid because it was so tangible. It was such a tangible discovery of they didn't know about these elements, and now they did because of her work, and it fit into this periodic chart, which I had hanging in my room, and you know, inspired me to kind of go and study chemistry and physics and all that kind of stuff. Uh, this is another quote I really like, which is kind of a, an understatement of a lifetime, probably. Um, I've frequently been questioned, especially by women, of how I could reconcile family life with a scientific career. Well, it has not been easy. And when you think about the timeline of her career, um, a lot of it happened very quickly, and I think that, well, it has not been an easy part kind of shows up in the timeline. So she moves from Poland to France to study at the Sorbonne, because she wasn't allowed to do advanced studies in Poland, uh, gets her master's degree, marries her husband, and very quickly has this amazing discovery of these new elements, and has her first kid along the way. And then she successfully isolates radium, she gets her, the Nobel Prize and her doctorate the same year, um, which is pretty astounding and mind-blowing, right? In 1903. Um, and then she has her second daughter, and then tragically her husband is killed in a traffic accident. 
And from then on, she continues her career, wins a Nobel, another Nobel Prize, and has a lot of interesting things happen. But that early career, you know, from um, discovering radium to when her husband dies is eight years. It's a really short, compressed amount of time. And you can imagine how sort of turbulent and um, amazing that time was for her and, and very difficult. Okay, so that's the refresher. That gives you some context. If you're interested, go read more. Um, now I'm gonna dive into a couple things related to her work that relates to today. So this section is called Open Sourcing Radium, and it really centers around sort of the published versus patent dilemma, which is not um, a new thing or an old thing. It's something that all researchers sort of grapple with. But there were some interesting aspects to it for her work and her times. So discovering radium. This is kind of the, the short cliff notes of how you discovered it. They started researching radioactivity. They developed some instrumentation that let them measure radioactivity very, very precisely. And they were able to tell that this mineral pitch blend that they were studying was producing more radiation than the known amount of uranium in that ore should do. So they hypothesized that there had to be another highly radioactive element that was unknown at this time and they actually ended up discovering polonium and radium. This was like a basic science discovery, right? The discovery of new elements. But Marie knew that she had some skeptics, and she wouldn't be able to really prove that radium existed, cement it into that place on the periodic chart, unless she was able to isolate it, to actually get an isolated sample that they could study. So then she started on this very arduous process of coming up with a, a separation, a refining technique. And sorry, my background is chemical engineering, so I get really into the refining and separation part of it. Um, so, so she spent a lot of time doing that. And at the end of really arduous work, during which she exposed herself to tons of radiation, but they didn't know about that then, uh, she came up with one-tenth of a gram of pure radium. And this was not secret science. This was like the secret sauce, right? This was a process. This was intellectual property on how you could refine and get to this point of separating out that element. So, publish or patent, right? What do you do? The discovery of the new elements, that's pure science. That would be hard to look at patenting. That kind of goes back to mankind. There's not really a, a, a precedent for that. But the process to refine new substances, there's a lot of precedent for patenting a chemical process. Much, much money has been made previous to this and after this from patenting that. This was an invention and could be patented. And so you would think that that might be um, an obvious path. Publish the pure science, patent this piece of it. But there was a catch. In the early 1900s in France, married women could not own property and this extended to intellectual property. So what this meant was that under the law at that time, married women shared a status of incapable with children and the insane. And this meant that they could not sign contracts or manage their own affairs or do any of these things. And so what this meant is at the time that she was winning the Nobel Prize, earning her doctorate at the same time, discovering two elements and the refining process to create it, Marie Curie could not enter into any contracts on her own, only through her husband. So, back to the publisher patent. How many of you have been involved in a patent process through work or whatever, right? Can you imagine doing that process and telling one of the lead people who worked on that project, I'm sorry your name can't be on the patent? because you're a married woman. That's kind of mind-blowing, but that was the exact position that they were in. And so it's hard to know from the record, the author does a great job of, of going through different uh, correspondence and letters and trying to get into what Marie and Pierre were thinking at this time. And it's hard to separa separate out, but it's hard to imagine that that did not influence their decision that she, she was the one that actually worked on the refining and separation process, the part that could be patentable. And Pierre studied the substance more in general. And if they would have patented, her name would have been erased from that part of the discovery, because it could not have been on the patent. 
So what did they do? They came up with something that looks very similar to me to an open sourcing model. They published the knowledge, they published the steps to do the refining process, and then Pierre patented the tools and measuring devices that were actually needed to do the process. And they provided consulting services, and they also started the Radium Institute. And what this looked a lot to me was like, we've open sourced our product, we've got a hosted subscription, we sell enterprise tools and services. <laughs> Does that look familiar? Yeah. And, um, and then the Radium Institute really acted like a thriving open source community. It was this exchange between industry and academics and people could contribute to, hey, I found a slightly better way to do this separation, but it all came back, in, it was like the whole thing was under you know, the, a license where everything had to be contributed back to the Radium Institute so it was shared. But at the same time, the Curies had, they sold their tools and their services and their consulting and were able to put that money back into their research. So it was a very interesting model. I think it was very forward looking and the way that they handled it was very interesting. The other part of this is that publishing gave a way for Marie to very concretely show her contributions which were always sort of under suspect or attack. Was she just sort of a secretary? Was she like a lab assistant? Or was she doing actual research, right? And to me, this same kind of thing can happen today where if you feel you're in that position, if you're committing to open source and you can go on GitHub and show these are my commits, you have a record that you can show of your work. And this was the same approach that she took. She relentlessly built this public persona and track record of her work. And this is uh, some of her notebooks, which are now being digitized uh, because they're still radioactive, so they have to be locked into a lead box. <laughs> and, um, you, but they are making them so that they're all viewable online, which is very cool. Um, so I added this section yesterday after the talk about Steve. Steve Money, the, the fictional male employee, right? And the first way that, that um, Marie Curie started publishing her results was to the Academy of Sciences, this very influential academic body in France. And she did it through this series of notes, which she could not go and read to this assembly because she wasn't a member. She had to get someone within that assembly to go and read the note for her. And she did three notes that were very influential and documented the discovery of radium. The first note, she's the, the only author, and she signs her full name with her Polish middle name. The second note, she follows her husband as the second author and abbreviates her Polish name to an S. And then the final note, she's the second author between two men, and her name is completely gone. Now she's just Madame P. Curie. So it's all her husband's name at that point. And the author makes a really great point that throughout those, Pierre's identity remains crystal clear. Marie's is fuzzy and keeps kind of changing. And as those notes got more significant, as they proved more and more significant things about the discovery, it was more important to attach them to someone who had personhood, who could, who could sign contracts and do things. And it was kind of like Steve made it easier to get some of you know, their deals going. Um, Marie found a way to kind of get her work in there and get it accepted, and she was still, on, you know, still involved. So this is all really fascinating. The, you could literally give like six talks on all this. The author goes, also goes through how she uses I, me, we, one of us, us, in all of her language in an interesting way. She starts out very much I and switches to one of us in a, in a more general way in a lot of the notes as well. Okay, so things were going good. They had their discovery recognized and um, you know, things were, were progressing. They won the Nobel Prize, they were a complete celebrity sensation. Radioactive stuff was super cool. Everybody wanted things that glow in the dark. Um, this is a picture of them in Vanity Fair in 1904, and he's got the glowing test tube, you know, giving this false impression of that. And um, things were going really good. They were progressing. They were getting money for their laboratory. Um, a lot of work was going on. And then tragedy strikes. And Pierre is killed by a carriage in the street, just a freak accident, gets, gets run over by a very heavy horse-drawn carriage. And this really starts to 
disrupt and cause new planning for, for Marie. So um, obviously very personally upsetting. She's got a one-year-old at this point and another daughter. Uh, but some good things came out of it. She is nominated to succeed her husband as a professor at the Sorbonne. So she's, they wanted someone to lead the laboratory, continue the work, and they, they let her do that, and she became the first full professor at the Sorbonne. And um, interestingly enough, now as a widow, she can own property. She is a person. She can sign contracts. And so this seems like a positive development, but what actually happens is that she's coming out of the shadows. Pierre cannot be the lead author on the papers anymore. It's back to her only again. And it becomes hard for the people who were kind of taking the view of, well, she can kind of participate because it's probably really her husband doing the work. They can't, they can't maintain that anymore. He's, he's not there. And the work is continuing. The lab work is going on. The discoveries are happening. She can do all these things. So she becomes very hard to ignore, and she becomes very irritating to the establishment at this point <laughs> um, for a couple of reasons. One, at this time in, in Fast forward a few years to 1911, there's this rising tide of French nationalism and traditionalism, and it was all about, we don't, we're worried about these modern influences and foreign influences, and there was a lot of rhetoric around that. And she was absolutely an example of that. She was from Poland, she wasn't French. Uh, she was doing all these things that women didn't do. And even before Pierre had died, they were seen as a very modern couple. They were a, a face of modernism. And so this became something that they had some backlash against. This all set the perfect storm for when in 1911, a seat on the Academy of Sciences opened up. Uh, this was this, you know, very, very established body, and it was where she had read the notes, and they really kind of controlled all the, all the science recognition and, and movement in France. So Pierre had, had had a seat on this, and these seats were for life. He had one in 1905. Um, then in 1910, another person left the, the academy, and a seat opened up, and Marie was a candidate for this. And it, the author in the book said, she seemed like a shoe-in, and I thought it was so funny to see the word shoe-in written out that I wanted to put it on my slide. Um, so it seemed like, she seemed like a shoe-in. Her radium work was progressing. She was the head of this laboratory that was reaching all over the world. France at that time saw radium as a strategic advantage. You know, they were kind of jealous of Ger Germany. They felt like Germany was getting ahead of them in science, but radium, they had radium as a French thing, and they really wanted to control it, and they felt like this was a competitive edge they didn't want to lose. So it seemed kind of obvious, but hold on, she's the first female candidate. And she knew that this was going to be an uproar. And she sent a note to the press trying to sort of calm down the press before things got going, saying these elections to the Academy are usually out of the public sight. It's not something that people spend a lot of time, you know, in the press talking about. I would find that embarrassing if this changed because of me. This was a good try. It did, it did not work. Um, it, the, the press went into a frenzy. This is a picture of Marie hiding behind her purse from like the paparazzi who would stand outside her laboratory and hunt her down. Um, it, it just grew and grew and grew. It was the talk of you know all the dinner parties. Would the Academy approve a female scientist? She had a lot of supporters. She had a lot of people that thought that that was moving too fast, too much change. And the press, unfortunately, really got into it and made this not just a choice between two scientists and about their work. They made it a choice between two, two worlds. There was a um, Edward Branley, he was an inventor of um, wireless telegraphs. This was his third time to try to get on the Academy, and he was the other candidate versus Curie. And they broke it up into Curie is like the modern academics, and they're scary. And Branley is the traditional establishment. And it became this fight between those two choices. And there was even a, a quote along the lines of, a vote for Curie was a vote for emotional turmoil, and a vote for Branley was a vote for universal values and tradition. And so this is the way it got framed in the media. And, um, and it became, you know, it, it grew and grew and grew and grew. And eventually they voted, no. She was not approved. She did not get on. 
Um, they elected Branley. There was a lot of talk, will she try again? A lot of people would, would reapply. Um, how long do you think it was until the first female candidate was elected? No Googling. Guess, somebody throw out numbers, how long? 60 years. Yeah, okay, 68 years. 1979, I, that blew me away. I kept going back and double checking that like many, many times because it was unbelievable. So that, it was very striking message that she was not approved. Be, one, because she did have such strong support and such amazing accomplishments to her name and, and was still not approved. People just felt that it was too much change too fast was the general feeling in, in the literature. So after that, things got even weirder. Um, there was more media hubbub. There were love letters stolen and published. There was an alleged affair. Uh, by the end of 1911, there were five duels fought over Marie Curie's honor, four including pistols and one including Epe. And there's actual video footage of the Epe duel, which is amazing. That is the actual footage. It's on YouTube. You can go and see it. <laughs> I know, unbelievable. Um, during that time, like the weeks before the duels were fought, she won her second Nobel Prize, which was hers alone in chemistry. And the, um, they wrote to her and said, well, maybe you should not come and accept that Nobel Prize until some of this like calms down a little bit. And she wrote back and said, uh, that's ridiculous. I don't see any connection between my scientific work and my personal life. And she went and accepted it anyway. And amazingly, she got to the end of this, and it, it just kind of fizzled out. She weathered the storm. She continued her career. She ran the Radiant Institute after that. But 1911 was just a crazy year of all kinds of um, you know, roadblocks and slander and things coming up. OK, so moving on. Um, there's a lot to read there, but I want to end on something more positive. And this was the kick, Marie Curie's Kickstarter campaign. And this was crowdsourcing radium, which was really interesting. Okay, so radium. It's 1921. Um, radium has been, you know, they, they published the process. Countries are producing it. How many grams of radium do you think the United States had in 1921? More than zero. Five. Okay, more than five, actually. The 20? Closer. The U.S. was the biggest producer of radium in 1921. We had 50 grams in the U.S. How many grams do you think the Radium Institute, which was the, the research hub for all the radium stuff, how many grams did they have? Less than one. How many grams did Marie Curie have for her own experiments? Zero. Um, she it was so expensive, and the reason for this was that radium was the most expensive substance in the world at that time. One gram cost $100,000. So she could not, she gave it all to her laboratory. She had research she wanted to do, but she didn't have any personal radium to do it on. So she meets this um, New York socialite, and Missy Brown from New York, and she was really a fan of Marie Curie. She has this conversation with her about radium. She can't believe that Marie Curie doesn't have any radium of her own, and she says, well, can't you buy some? Don't you have all the patents for that process? And she says, no, we didn't patent it. Um, and so she's appalled by this and decides to take action, and she starts a subscription fund to buy Marie Curie a gram of radium. And this is going to be a personal gift from the gift from the women of America to Marie Curie. And um, the way that this was formed up was amazing. Originally, she, you know, she was very wealthy. She thought, I'll go ask 10 of my friends to give $10,000, we're done. But then she decided to make it something bigger. And she started something called the Radium Book that was in all of these banks. And anyone could go in and make a deposit of any amount. And so it actually ended up being mothers and school teachers and cleaning women donating like a dollar here, having bake sales, literally bake sales to buy radium. Um, along with some wealthy people who did bigger, bigger do donations. And this became this very powerful thing that you could go in and contribute to that along with you know, someone else who was really wealthy. And it was an amazing success. They scraped together three times the amount of money that Einstein won for the Nobel Prize that year in physics. This would be like us today saying, you know, we're going to do a 
crowd raising, fundraising thing to give a million dollars, or I guess three million dollars, to um, a scientist somewhere to do some research. They didn't even know what research she was going to do. Like, they just said, she's going to do it. We trust her. She's going to do something good for humanity. But it was, it was a resounding success. She came to the U.S. to accept her um, gram of radium. It had to travel back to Europe in all these separated lead boxes in this ship. And, um, and then they, there was even more money, and that went into a trust fund, which actually paid for her laboratory in future years. So resounding success and, and really a, a positive part of it. Okay, so why talk about all this, all this history, right? There's a lot of history, maybe too much history for some people, uh, but why talk about it? I think it's really important because for me, it gives a lens for all the things that are happening today. Sometimes I'll read, you know, a controversy and I'll go back and switch out the names to be someone historical or something that we think, you know, makes sense. And it gives you a different context. So when you talk about certain people not being allowed to do certain things, switch the names and be like, oh, it's Marie Curie not being allowed to be on the Academy of Scientists. Does that still make sense? It's kind of a tool for giving some context. And it helps in conversations with um, people maybe that you're you know, trying to broaden their view a little bit. So I think it's really important. The other reason is the, the power of heroes. And, um, so I went to see the Wonder Woman movie this summer with my five-year-old niece. Did you guys see it? Um, it's pretty amazing, right? Yeah. So I was really busy this summer, and I didn't think that much about it before I went to see it. And afterwards, I was talking to my husband, and I said, wow, you know, that, re that really hit me in a way I, I wasn't expecting. And part of it was because my niece was sitting beside me, and literally the whole time she's like this. She's very precocious. She's like, I cannot believe this. I cannot believe this. She probably said that 50 times during the movie. Um, and so that was very powerful. But I said, gosh, it, you know, really, I really, I'm, you know, was just kind of working through a lot. And, and my husband was like, what are you talking about? He goes, you, you really liked Wonder Woman when you were a kid. I'm sure this was cool for you to see the movie that you always wanted. And I was like, yeah. And he was like, remember that name tag? And I was like, Oh yeah, my name tag. <laughs> and so this is when I was little, I had one of those like mechanical label makers where you turn the dial and squeeze it. And that was like my favorite toy. And so this was a name tag I made for myself that said Wonder Woman, Mandy White, Queen of Hawaii. I had been to Hawaii, I thought it was a cool place. Um, <laughs> and so <laughs> my mom, it's in this little frame, because my mom sent it to me after I'd had my first kid and I was trying to figure out how to go back to work and it seemed really complicated to be like, now I'm a mom, and, but how do I get back into my career and how do I do all this? And, and she sent me my name tag and said, look all the things you thought you could be when you were five at the same time. You didn't see any contradictions. I think you can figure this out. And I was like, okay, thanks. So I, I, kept, my, I kept my name tag and, and my husband was like, yeah, you know, that was your hero, that's important. So then I took this a little step further and I said, okay, so thinking about Marie Curie, when I think back to being a little kid and I think about the books I had read and the people I knew about and how that might inform careers I wanted to do, I was like, math, I love math, Alan Turing, all this, very cool, you know, that was great. And then I was like, ooh, I want to be an archaeologist, I want to be a paleontologist, I want to go discover the dinosaurs in Montana like Jack Horner. And these were all heroes that I read about and thought were really interesting. Computers. I read The Cuckoo's Egg. Who's read that? Yeah, awesome book, huh? Um, this was like mind blown. I loved this book. And then I knew about Grace Hopper because my grandmother was in the Navy. She probably told me about Grace Hopper at least once a week for my whole life growing up. And so, um, so I knew about that. And then I knew about Marie Curie. And so when I finally grew up and I went to college and I was picking my major, and I would be the first to say that... Um, female role models didn't influence me, and I thought I could do whatever I wanted and all of that. But what did I choose? I chose chemistry and computer science. And hard to untangle, like in my 18-year-old brain, how much that factored in. But what I said was, I think those are more realistic for me. Maybe that's because I had seen some role models or some heroes that you know, were, were more like me in, in those fields. I don't know. Um, just putting it out there. And, and I think, to me, Marie Curie, when she's navigating all those hurdles of 1911 and, and her, you know, driving her scientific career, 
That's like the scene in Wonder Woman where she's running through no man's land, dodging the bullets and reflecting them off her armbands. And she is that kind of hero to me, and, I, and that's why, partly why this book was so important. So that's it. I highly recommend the book. I have a copy of it here if you want to see it in the, in the flesh. And um, I'd love to talk about any of these topics. If you read the book, I'd love to hear from you. Um, and thanks for listening. All right, thanks.